it's a great pleasure for me to uh, to welcome you to the next uh, to the next part of the program. This is uh, what is uh, becoming uh, its own day, the Longevity Medicine Day, which uh, has been, uh, I think, a really fantastic addition to our to our meeting. And uh, this is, of course, spearheaded spearheaded by Evelyn Bischoff, who's done a fantastic job in in gathering some of the leading individuals in uh, translating the, the, the basic knowledge about aging into clinical trials. And I think this is really the future, so I'm super excited about, about this. And uh, I, I don't have anything more to say, but let's give Evelyn a, a, a round of applause and welcome her. Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much uh, to Morten Shabuk Knudsen, Professor Morten, for, the, for, for allowing me to be a part of this day, and thank you for all the speakers that are here with us today um, to make this day. It's really phenomenal and um, extremely emotional for me to have Longevity Medicine Day. Um, as a physician, it's a dream come true, and I want to extend my thanks also to Professor Javoronkov, who brought me to the ARDD team and also to Professor Daniela, who helped to organize, who is the main organizer here as well. Um, I will not take much of your time and will uh, give just a little bit of an overview of um, what we'll see today, I hope. <laughs> no, not see you next year. This day or this half day is really dedicated to bring together people who are involved in longevity medicine as it is now being translated from gerosciences and, um, and the science from the bench really to, to, the, to the bed, meaning really translation from what we see in the lab and on, in the studies towards the patient. And also to talk about or with those who are already working with patients like myself and, and other colleagues. So you will see a lot of MDs um, speaking tonight, uh, today and, and not only. And we will have number one, um, oh, this is the wrong one. <laughs> we will have today um, two sessions. We'll find the right. Yeah, we'll have today two sessions that will contain lectures, and then we'll have three main panel discussions that will be moderated together with my co-pilot today, Professor Dr. Uh, Sebastian Tuol. <laughs> Sorry, opening slides, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Right, so we will have the moderated three panel discussions um, among the speakers, we'll have an opening session from Professor Zhao, who is the president of the United States uh, National Academy of Medicine. He is unfortunately not able to join us today in person, but he pre-recorded a lecture. So for all of the MDs here, uh, I'm sure this is a great honor to, to hear him speaking about longevity medicine. And then we'll have Dr. Mahmoud Khan, Dr. Felipe Sierra, and Dr. Professor James Kirkland. In the second lecture panel, after a short break, we'll have um, Dr. Daniel, uh, Andrea Meyer, this is Professor Andrea Meyer speaking, Dr. John Manick, and Dr. Nir Bratzilai. And then we will have the three panel sessions that will be coordinated, and we will be talking on the translation on gerosciences to the clinic as it is being practiced and the scalability of it. Then we'll be talking with some of the great people working on geroprotectors and senolytics, so actually bringing the longevity interventional part into reality and also discuss the randomized clinical trials, so what is really needed to bring them into the practice and validate them. And then in the last panel, we'll be talking about the innovation, the monitorings and interventions that are needed for uh, setting up the best longevity diagnostics. And at the end of it, we will have a take-home panel. So we will focus really on the big questions. We asked all the speakers, we will ask them, um, to have one big question from each of their speeches, and we will discuss the practicability and uh, make sure that everyone who is here will go home with concrete take-home messages. And there will be a few highlights that will be uh, also announced uh, that 
um, we are very, very happy about. Number one is that the longevity medicine course, medicine um, in longevity education, has been accredited CME points on the advanced uh, part of the course. <laughs> And great kudos to Professor Javronkov, who was the initiator um, of the course and brought team together, Professor Moskalev and uh, Morten and, and others to, to bring it together. So we will, we will have a little bit more information about it, but for all of the MDs and everybody who wants to get um, educated on the basics and advanced knowledge, um, they can participate in the course that is free and get CME accredited. Uh, and get also certified uh, as doctors uh, in that field. And this course is also available in Chinese for all those colleagues here who are from China or joining live from China. I know that there are many. And we'll have another um, announcement uh, that my colleague, Professor Andrea Meyer, will be talking more in detail about the creation of Longevity Medicine Society, a uh, society for medical doctors in longevity medicine that has been founded on the 8th of August 2022. And we will have also um, the executive committee members partially speaking here. So Professor James Kilkant is with us, Professor Neil Bartzilai as well. And um, we are very much looking forward to hearing more about what this society is about. We will also be discussing in this um, entire session in the panels, the definition of longevity medicine, which will be one of the main outputs, the first outputs of the Longevity Medicine Society. And uh, I guess I will now pass over to my co-pilot, Professor Sebastian Twold, um, with a tiny introduction of why do we really need this workshop? Why, why are we here? Why are we discussing it? Why are we bringing the physicians? Well, um, I'm remembering one of the phrases from, you know, almost five years ago, Professor Javronkov told me the real bottleneck right now in translating longevity or bringing it is um, the physicians or are the physicians. So we really need to bring them on board, educate them and help them to accelerate the field. And by now we know that this is one of the most interdisciplinary and multimodal field. So we have a lot of debate also on public health and uh, we need to also build this dialogue with AI computational scientists, with the industry and um, other people so that we can together uh, with them build a longevity ecosystem and expand it further towards the practice. So with this, I would like to thank you very much and welcome you once again and thank you so much for being here either in person or virtually and uh, would like to also encourage you to ask questions. We do have enough time to accommodate those on Slack and in person after each le um, lecture and during the panel discussions. So please be interactive, ask um, which, whichever questions you might have had or will have during the session. Thank you very much. Well, I want to uh, welcome everyone to this workshop, and I want to thank Eva for, you know, uh, convincing me to uh, contribute to try to help with this. But I want to uh, clarify that she's the brain behind this, and she's done all of the effort, you know, be behind this. Um, I also want to thank the organizers of uh, the meeting, Morten, Daniela, and Alex, for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to share a few um, uh, slides about the journal that I'm editing, Nature Aging, which is a, a newcomer on, in the publishing landscape in aging and longevity research we launched last year in 2021. And I want to explain a little bit, you know, the, the mission of the journal and how it inserts itself in the, the sort of general push towards uh, uh, you know, research in aging and, and on longevity. So, uh, you know, m my view of aging and in particular population aging is that it is a major grand societal challenge in the same spirit as, you know, for instance, the UN uh, SDG, the Sustainable Developmental Goals. And I think recently they've actually made uh, a review of um, which of their 16 SDG uh, aligns with the idea of trying to address aging in, in our society, and I encourage you to, to take a look at this. But basically the premise is the following. 
we know that life expectancy is increasing, uh, and these are stats from, from a few years ago, but the, we know that the number of people over the age of 60 is expected to double by 2050 to about 22% of the world population. And that's on the one hand. On the other hand, over 23% of the global disease burden uh, is due to disorders affecting people age 60 and over. And yet, they only represent 12% of the, the world population. If you actually look at high-income countries, that figure uh, increases to 50%. So this global burden of disease has often been uh, measured as uh, DALI, which are these disability adjusted life years. And that's the idea that, you know, with the progress of modern medicine, we've been living longer, and this is going to increase even further. But yet, when we reach these older ages, we develop disabilities, we develop diseases, and that's captured in DALI by uh, the years lived with the disability of disease. And sometimes these diseases lead to uh, our early demise in, in comparison to what we can expect to live. And so there is basically a gap between what we call the lifespan and what we call the health span, the, the, uh, the amount of time we spend in good health, uh, uh, in particular later in life. So as I said, medicine has allowed us to increase the number of years that we have in our lives, but one of the big questions I think that we're all facing as a society now is how do we add life to years? And one of the good news is that this is being recognized as a very important uh, area of, of interest for our society. And if you look at academia, industry, and, and society as a whole, it is clear that uh, we view aging as an important area of investment. So here on this slide, I've just captured a few of the organizations that have uh, decided to focus on aging. Some of them are older than others. Uh, and it really is, is a tiny fraction, and I'm sure you can recognize some names here, including academic centers that are focused on aging research, when you know, aging used to be something that was more sort of uh, spread out across departments. And, and you see more and more multidisciplinary research being focused in academic centers uh, on aging and longevity. Similarly, we have seen quite a few uh, uh, biotech being uh, interested in starting uh, on a, uh, their, their research on a geroscience principle. I think you know, one of the things that we also currently see is that the big pharma uh, companies are also starting to develop some interest and, and working with the, the smaller ones. And obviously there is also members in civil society. The, the WHO has uh, uh, developed a program called the Decade of Healthy Aging, which is less on the geroscience side, but is more on the, so, the social science side of things. How do we age well? How do we maintain uh, uh, health and well-being, mental well-being in older ages? In addition to that, I think the field is also leveraging uh, investment that, have, uh, that are starting but that have also occurred in the past in terms of establishing uh, uh, human cohorts to specifically study uh, aging. And that's certainly uh, something that's, uh, uh, that's going to be uh, extremely helpful. Again, you know, I'm sorry if your favorite organization is not on this slide. Uh, it's just like a tiny little uh, uh, snapshot of this. And so all of this to say that uh, this uh, current situation, along with you know, some uh, other aspects, like the fact that uh, aging research is growing at a fast pace, there are more and more publications, there is more and more uh, public funding towards aging research, are some of the uh, reasons for why we decided to launch Nature Aging uh, in the first place. And this is really a project that started in 2018. Uh, so I've been working at the, at the company for uh, more than 10 years. And, and in 2018, uh, I was tasked to think about new uh, areas where we could launch new journals in our portfolio. And Nature Aging was one of them. So I came up with a concept, uh, and eventually I, I, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, be asked to uh, launch it. So Nature Aging is a, is a thematic journal. And by that, we mean that we publish research uh, about you know, anything that is about aging and longevity and age-related diseases, it covers the entire space. And we think there is very much some uh, uh, value in cross-pollinating uh, different fields and promoting interactions and going um, you know, across silos and bring people together so they can think about a problem going all the way from you know, the molecular biology, the core biology of aging, 
all the way to um, how we implement that in, in our society and how we build a, a better community uh, for people in uh, older ages. So we publish research on aging and age-related diseases that can help improve human health span. So I think this is a key concept that we're going to discuss this afternoon. It's very much you know, uh, linked to this idea of longevity medicine as well as lifespan, but I think you know, uh, if there is an emphasis, I think it's probably that. Uh, the journal also publishes research that addresses societal challenges and sees opportunities associated with uh, population aging, aging. I think it's important to remember that not all, bad is, not, not all is bad in aging and that there are also opportunities that need to be seized. We have uh, four broad areas of research that I like to think uh, align under one theme of health in aging. The first one is the biology of aging and longevity, and it's the typical you know, uh, laboratory-based research into the fundamentals of, of aging research, um, and uh, we publish a lot of those. We also publish clinical and preclinical studies on age-related disease, such as Alzheimer's disease or osteoarthritis, or uh, you know, other conditions that are associated with aging. We publish epidemiology and, and public health research, and finally, you know, also a, a few papers uh, in the social sciences. And, you know, I like to think that nature aging, because it captures this uh, a, a tremendous di diversity in research around the theme of aging and longevity, it, it proposes something that is unique that is not offered by other journals. That's all I'll say about the journal. I'll just show you a, a quick snapshot. You know, as I said, we launched last year in, in January 2021. These are the covers for, uh, from our 12th issue in 2021, and it does, you know, to some extent capture what I was saying about this diversity in aging research, all the way from, uh, you know, uh, genes and molecules uh, to, to society. If you want to talk more about the journal, you know, feel free to come and, and, and speak with me, to contact me by email. I'm here at the whole meeting, and I'd be happy to, to tell you more about this. Now, what about longevity medicine? So, uh, Eva already mentioned the article that they published uh, with us earlier last year. And uh, th this, you know, I want to say that, I, you know, longevity medicine has been part of our interest from the beginning. In fact, this article was published in our first issue. Uh, it's a paper that uh, has received a, a decent amount of interest. And, you know, Eva mentioned that uh, this paper introduced a, a definition of longevity medicine. So the little story behind this paper is that um, I, um, I was listening to a talk that Alex gave in 2020. I can't remember which conference it was. And I was like, this is really interesting. And in that same conference, there was a, a presentation by Kai Fu Li, um, who was talking about machine learning uh, in the context also of aging research. And I thought, wow, that would be very interesting to put these guys together. <laughs> And see, and see if they could, you know, uh, write something. And I wrote to, to Alex and he said, sure, let's do something. And eventually they were joined by uh, Eva. And during the editing of that piece, I said, well, why don't you come up with a definition? You know, I think we need some definition. So here's what they said. We define, and obviously there's a lot more in the paper. Uh, we define longevity medicine as a branch of precision medicine that is specifically focused on promoting health span and lifespan and is powered by AI technology. So I, I think we're going to talk about this today. But there are a few uh, important concepts here that we will need to impact. I mean, already it's um, the idea that it's a form of precision medicine. So it's uh, targeted at the individual. And I guess this is open for discussion um, uh, at some point. Um, I already talked about health span and lifespan. And is powered by AI technology refers to the idea that it is a medicine that is very much focused and, and interested in endpoints that have to do with biological age and that the technology that you know, we need to develop or that already exists can capture that. You know, but it's work in progress and there's still a lot more to do. As um, Eva mentioned, you know, I think this is a brief uh, and relatively uh, high level definition of longevity medicine. And I think through this workshop, we can perhaps think about uh, having something that is more comprehensive, more concrete. I mean, you know, this is an open question. So this is the, uh, the plan for today, the mini lectures, the panel discussion, and the last one, this open floor discussion. So you know, I think all the speakers will contribute to this, but hopefully people from the audience, both uh, in person and virtual, can also uh, contribute. I think there's a Slack channel that uh, we can use, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, I don't know how we'll take a look at the question, but we will. 
And, and so we can revisit perhaps the definition. I think we should discuss the promises and the challenges of what longevity medicine is, its current states, uh, its future goals, uh, what success would look like, and, and how to get there. And so with these words, I think, you know, maybe Alex has a few uh, additional things to say. Otherwise, I think we can transition to, to the lecture series. Uh, I hugely appreciate uh, um, uh, the kind words and also uh, such amazing, credible people uh, joining the longevity revolution, so to speak. Uh, and thank you for pointing out the paper with Kai Foli. You made it happen, by the way. Uh, and after this publication, longevity medicine became even more credible. And people, as they get more prosperous, they want to live better and longer because, as a matter of fact, the uh, threshold uh, of income where you get diminishing returns in happiness is appro approximately $60,000, $70,000 a year. After that, you don't feel happier. So once you reach that, um, uh, that level, you start thinking prosperity, right? What, what's next? So I mean, what's next is actually more life. Life is such a beautiful thing, and we need to make it available for everybody without disease, and that's where longevity medicine comes into play. So we already see that science is scratching the surface uh, of making people live longer. Uh, there are dual purpose therapeutics. We've seen that with RestorBio, where they were trying to take uh, uh, some of those forward from Novartis. There are many pharmaceutical companies who realize that some of the cancer drugs that might, uh, that have, you know, bad name in the, in the industry, I mean, in the, in the society, people think that cancer drugs are bad. Some of those cancer drugs, they may have anti-aging properties, may, may have anti-Alzheimer's properties. And the power of AI, the power of big data, allow us to be able to repurpose those drugs already. Uh, drugs like rapamycin and metformin may have huge promise uh, for everybody on the planet, and those are very established therapeutics, and there are many, many new ones. So pharma is realizing the power of uh, dual-purpose therapeutics. They're making longevity medicine credible. But at the end of the day, the most important uh, uh, stakeholder group in our industry are the physicians because the physicians are interfacing the patients, they are working within the clinically approved protocols, and they need education. They need to, uh, first of all, respond to patients who are reading everything that, uh, you know, all those sensational stories about uh, the NMNs and the metformins and rapamycin and many other technologies or, you know, oxygen chambers. And then they need to explain uh, to the patient uh, what, what, it, what it really means. Should they do it? Should they not do it? Um, and uh, currently, this industry lacks education. So that is why I partnered with a wonderful uh, physician scientist, uh, Dr. Evelyn Biskup, and by the way, again, Morten Scheibe Knudsen, the superhero who is MD, PhD, who runs uh, the um, Center for Healthy Aging, the Laboratory of Biology at the Center of Healthy Aging of the University of Copenhagen, who actually made this conference possible to develop the longevity medicine course for physicians. So if you go to longevity.degree, it's free, CME accredited, so 101, 201. We're currently asking for volunteers to join this, um, uh, the, 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 this, this movement, this, this platform to create more courses for physicians, to make physicians more educated in specific areas uh, of science and technology that will help them uh, do clinical trials better because currently with, uh, you know, amazing initiatives like Hevolution. They are like a few years down the road, they will be testing drugs, right? They will need to run clinical trials. They will need to have physicians who are prepared to run those multi-center trials with aging biomarkers. They need to know how they work. So, and that's what longevity medicine provides you with. The insights about what those early stage geroprotectors are, what is more credible in the industry, and what to prepare for, and where to go for clinical trials. Uh, and how to get the drugs approved in this, in this industry. So please do join this movement. Go to longevity.degree, take the course. If you want to contribute to this initiative, please contact Eva because she is now technically running it. Uh, and also we might acknowledge, we might need to acknowledge, we need to acknowledge uh, the tens of volunteers who are currently contributing to this initiative. So we go to longevity.degree, you can see uh, all those wonderful people. 
every week they spend enormous amounts of time to contribute to this initiative uh, and to police all the articles, prepare the courses, and now we will have more courses coming up, longevity medicine for venture capitalists. So they will uh, get more understanding of the uh, you know, business models in this, in this area. There will be longevity medicine for psychology. If you want to join that one, please do, because again, psychology, uh, psychological age is the most plastic. You can convince yourself that you are younger. Read Laura Carstensen, Helen uh, Fong. That's a beautiful area of longevity for psychology, and you can probably create feedback loops between biology and psychology and make you know, some of the psychotherapy more credible uh, in this area, make people younger and happier. Uh, so we want to create courses on that as well. So please do join the movement. It would be great to have more great uh, articles in Nature Aging, promoting this wonderful field, and also maybe you know, the AAAS should start a journal, Science Aging at some point in time, Lancet has one. Um, uh, I think a few other, are, uh, others have one. So we need to have more journals in this area and we need to have more uh, pharma companies getting this, this field. Currently we are supporting four out of the top 10 uh, in early stage R&D for aging research and synalytics, synofibrotics. Uh, we're not developing synalytics ourselves. Uh, and um, I think that the pharmaceutical industry realized that this is a trend. It's great to do dual purpose therapeutics. You can do it within a traditional paradigm of pharmaceutical drug development and uh, possibly extend human life. And if your patient doesn't respond to the target that you selected for their specific disease, they might still benefit indirectly by having this anti-aging effect. At the end of the day, if your outcome measure is survival, the patient would benefit. So the pharmaceutical industry needs to get into this field. If you know any big pharma, please do get them into this conference next year. Next year is going to be 10th annual, and I'm pretty sure the longevity day is going to be just dramatic. This is the biggest conference in the field, and again, would like to thank Yeva, and I would like to thank Morton uh, and Sebastian and everybody who made it happen, uh, and Daniela Bakula. So thank you very much. Alex was actually the person who had the idea last year to organize this workshop that turned into a Longevity Medicine Day, um, which is truly, truly phenomenal for us and revolutionary. Um, I would like to extend also a very warm welcome to all our viewers from China. I get the messages that they are with us. My patients are with, with us, so... Um, 大家好,我们非常非常感谢你,你们和我们看一看. Um, and I would like to transfer to something that is just as revolutionary for me as a physician, and I'm sure um, most of my physician friends uh, will share that feeling. Professor Victor Zhao, who is um, the president of the National um, Academy, is like one of the main persons for any physicians in the entire world. Um, has agreed to give us a welcome note and a welcome speech and his few thoughts about longevity medicine, which is such a momentum because it's so symbolic um, for, for what is actually happening. Longevity medicine is crystallizing as a discipline. Now there will be a lot of discussion if uh, this will be a sub-discipline of geriatrics or internal medicine or if at some point of time it will be a separate one. Whichever way it goes, it's happening. And I think this is the most beautiful thing for us. Andrea, I think, <laughs> um, is, is sharing this enthusiasm. So uh, with this, um, without further ado, I would <laughs> ask Morten for help again to help us um, stream the lecture of Professor Zhao. Good afternoon. I'm Victor Zhao, the president of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. And it's a great honor to be joining you virtually and to help open this Longevity Medicine Day at the ninth annual Aging Research Drug Discovery Meeting. I first want to recognize Dr. Evan Bischoff and Dr. Sebastian Thiel, organizers of this year's Longevity Medicine Workshop. Looks like a really great program. Today's lineup features an array of outstanding scientists, including many of my friends, Drs. Nir Bazali, 
and Eric Verdon, Jim Kirkland, Tom Rendell, and of course, my good friend, Dr. Mahmoud Khan, among many others. You know, longevity medicine is a topic of huge importance. Global aging is well underway, and the number of older people will continue to expand in the coming decades. Already in 2020, we surpassed the milestone. The number of people aged 60 years and older outnumber children younger than five years old. As predicted by 2050, 20% of the global population will be 65 and older, while only 6% will be under five years old. Now, this change has too often been characterized as in negative terms, like the silver tsunami. But I think it's important to emphasize the opportunities that this demographic change will bring. I hope today's conversation will highlight steps for researchers and care providers to move forward to maximize the quality of life and health outcomes for the older populations, what we call achieving healthy longevity. At the current pace, population aging is poised to impose a significant strain on economies, health system, and social structures worldwide. But it really doesn't have to be that way. I can envision an explosion of potential new medicines, treatments, technologies, and preventive and social strategies that could help transform the way that we age and ensure better health, function, and productivity during period of extended longevity. I can also imagine ways in which achieving health longevity will contribute to economic growth and even more productive society. I know that some of the innovators and creative minds behind these futuristic scientific advances are here in this meeting right now in Copenhagen and others virtually. So we all know that we need multidisciplinary solutions to support the advances and the breakthroughs in health longevity. At the National Academy of Medicine, we made finding approaches to global health longevity a, a, a priority. Three years ago, we launched the National Academy of Medicine, NAM, Grand Challenge in Health Longevity. One of the major initiatives in the Health Longevity uh, Grand Challenge is the global competition, a multi-year international competition designed to create an innovation movement to accelerate breakthroughs in health longevity. You know, the first two cycles of these awards in 2020 and 2021 were highly successful, receiving 1,500 applications each year from over 50 countries and regions. And we are repeating this in 2022 and for another three years. I think this demonstrates the immense interest in this area and the potential for major leaps forward in the innovation. Today, you're discussing some of the major advances in the field. Researchers studying a multitude of biologic pathways for slowing or even reversing the progression of aging. Advances such as human genome editing, regenerative medicine, and partial reprogramming promise to shift or even reverse the path of aging and disease. And of course, the rise of big data and AI, artificial intelligence, shows great potential enabling precision medicine, which can help us tailor treatments and interventions to individuals. And this may optimize prevention treatment strategies for age-related cognitive changes, among many other key needs for adults who are living into their 80s, 90s, and beyond. So those of you who work in longevity medicine understand the great potential of this field. Discussion you have today are important ones. Interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary efforts are necessary to translate basic research to clinical point of care and ultimately towards improving population health. And achieving health longevity will require not only the work of our medical scientists, but also computer scientists, engineers, experts in social, behavior, behavioral health, and many more. So I'm very excited about this meeting. I'm hopeful that today's conversations spark great insights and, of course, potential collaborations going forward. So 
Good luck. Enjoy your meeting. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And my best wishes for a very successful workshop. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> distantly uh, to Professor Zhao. Now we will have uh, the opening of our first session of lectures, starting with Dr. Mahmoud Khan, who is tremendous exceptional personality, a physician, MD, that developed his further career through various paths of industry and is now in longevity, longevity science, longevity medicine, from a part that is so crucial for all of us as scientists, as researchers, as patients, as physicians, from the side of the funding. <laughs> um, exceptional as he is, he will be talking without slides, and it's my great honor to present him. He's the CEO of the Hevolution Foundation, which I'm sure most of you have already heard about. It's a great honor to have you. Thank you for being here. I'm assuming this is working, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay, when Eva, first of all, asked me, and Alex asked me to come and speak, I'm honored. Uh, what was uh, scary for me is that uh, as famously Michelangelo said when he'd finished David, uh, I'm still learning. And in my case, I haven't done anything. So I'm definitely still learning. I, didn't, I thought about, you know, so what am I going to contribute here? I have a teacher, a mentor of mine with Victor Zhao who just spoke. Everything I know about aging science has been taught to me by many people in this room. Felipe, Michael Rinkle somewhere in the audience, Nir Berzelai who should be on his way, uh, Joan Manick, and many, many others. So, as a CEO, and I guess third time as a CEO of different organizations, I stepped back and I said, you know, why did I take this role on, and where's the opportunity? Not as a scientist, which for me was a long time ago, but what does the field need? Why does it need leadership, and what can we do? And if we take that approach, it raises some important questions, and I hope to leave you with probably more questions than answers, but hopefully some thoughts on how we might move forward from this amazing start you've had. And the field for the last 20 years has really accelerated. There's no question. And for the young people in the audience who sort of think this is moving too slow, I'm of the generation when we actually had to get pre-approval with a long two pages of forms to get a statin approved to prescribe that a statin to a patient who'd had a heart attack. If you hadn't had a heart attack, you were not eligible and not considered to be treated safely with statins. It's come a long way, and I can give you lots of examples. And the second thing I would look at is coming from the US, although I grew up in England, the US may be the largest, most lucrative market for drugs. It is not the most innovative regulatory market for drugs and metformin, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, I can go, the list goes on. The US was not the first market to launch. So it really raises some questions as to what are the innovative markets where the first step should be taken. And for entrepreneurs, is it, is it the US? Or is, are there other markets that are the stepping stones to get to the economic justification for treatments in this field? Many of you have already heard the economic, social, and epidemiological argument to treat aging. I, I don't need to tell this audience that. Yet it does raise the question, 20 years after making that argument, and I think about 20 years ago when the uh, NIA started this whole drug assessment for aging, we still haven't got to translational medicine. And when that happens, you have to ask yourself the question, why? What is, where's the gap between policy, funding, and the science? Some of it, those gaps are scientific, some of those are not. The scientific rationale for treating aging, most of it's based on cell therapy, cells, animal models. Most of those animal models are not really for aging, but they're created as models, some sort of genetic manipulation, diet manipulation, whatever, but not healthy animals that are necessarily aging in the most case. We have human epidemiological data, most of it's association, and with all the question marks around association data. 
So th th those questions last. The second is the need, and I'm going to emphasize this, the need, even where we do have human data in randomized prospective trials, very few that there are, is that translation of those studies need to be validated and independently reproduced by other investigators than the champions of the field itself. Until that happens, the rest of the scientific community is not going to follow. We're preaching to the choir here, but the reality of it is, statin, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, what have you, were not democratized until the rest of the field of the broader sense of therapeutics and medicine followed. And so I think a major question for leaders in this field and publi uh, publishers, editors, is to say how do we now democratize this idea so that it actually now translates. And when I teach at business schools or uh, law schools, which are the two schools that I get to teach at mostly, although I'm a physician, I, medical schools tend to, be, tend to avoid some of my comments, I guess. But it does raise the question, how do you democratize technology for the benefit of all? And until it's for the benefit of all, it's not going to happen. And that's a major question that we collectively have to ask ourselves. When this room is filled with the majority of people who are not from this field, we'll have succeeded. We can double, triple, quadruple the size of this room, but it needs the others to come along. And we'll talk a little bit about that. That raises the next question. And I'm going to put a question forward, which is what's the difference between invention and innovation? Innovation is used way too loosely all the time. We all think we're innovators. We love it. It's become sort of the standard jargon. Yet we should ask ourselves, what is the difference between an inventor and an innovator? Well, you ha when you come up with an invention, you get a patent. You get a, this star publication in Nature Aging. It's all great. But other than the inventor, it doesn't change anybody's life. When that in invention changes the lives of the end user, that's an innovation. It may not be a star publication. It may not make the best patent. It may not be the most valuable thing on, the pa on paper. But I assure you, it's not an innovation until it's democratized. So let me give you examples of p innovations that never made star publications, but they were based on great academic work. The internet, GPS, email, although I might argue if that's an innovation, good or bad, I don't know. Cell phone technology, steroids. Steroids were never patented. Change medicine, penicillin. There's no patent issued for penicillin. Change medicine. Hundreds of millions of lives. Electronic cars. Changing the way we think about transportation. All of these are innovations. They've made huge changes to people's lives. Built up on dozens or hundreds of inventions. That's the difference. Innovators figure out the end use and democratize it. Cell phone technology when I was in my 20s and 30s, it was something that you saw on TV with some movie star using it. It took Indian business entrepreneurs to democratize it. Not Americans, not Europeans. They figured out how to make it at two cents a minute. What was the difference? They democratized it by figuring out a business model that says leverage existing capital infrastructure, share capital infrastructure, and then on the variable, make the profit. That was innovation. It didn't make a publication, but all of us now take it for granted, including the rickshaw driver in India and China and Africa. That was innovation. So I'm giving you these examples because it does raise questions about how we have to think about our industry and what will it take. It then raises the next question, which is, are we going to go alone, fast, get there quickly, and be unique? Or, as the African proverb we've all heard, are we going to go along with many, go far, because we shared it? By the way, all those innovations I mentioned 
almost none of them were patented. They were funded, the basic science in many cases, including the most recent COVID vaccines, were funded by public funds and philanthropy. Most of the technology underlying the COVID vaccine, which is the most recent example, was DARPA and NIH. Government funding, public funding, that then created huge business opportunity, okay? Imagine if the internet had been patented. Would we have the global businesses we now take for granted this meeting? It raises a question, doesn't it? So, being specific to Jira Science then, what are the models we have to think about? What are the tools this field is going to need? And I'm not saying products, tools. There's a gap in the tools that we need to understand the science, translate it into humans, and then democratize it at scale. Which means we can sit there pointing fingers at the regulator for being too slow, or we bring the regulator along and we figure out what is the problem the regulator is trying to solve. Let me remind our young people in this room, when I was a young, uh, early in my career, I practiced endocrinology. Some of you are old enough to remember, we all thought the best biomarker for cardiovascular disease was HDL. Most people argue, yeah, that's good. And then we said, we're going to develop drugs for raising HDL. And it was right here in Europe, the first studies were done that showed when you pharmacologically raise HDL, the mortality went up. It was a great biomarker in animals. It was a great biomarker in epidemiology until we tested it. That's the problem the regulators facing. And so they have to think this through. So we as scientists are going to say, how do we bring them along in this? How do we make these tools available to academics, entrepreneurs, and industry? And unfortunately, in many cases, governments haven't stepped up to fund tool development. Industry certainly won't fund the tool development for the most part, maybe precision cancer, because there's a direct therapeutic link to it. And venture capital doesn't see it as its mission either, which is fair. Not criticism, it's fair. Though every one of these has a mission, has a mandate. You can't go outside the mandate of either your government funder or your investor. So how do you fund, not only along these disciplines, but how do you fund across national boundaries? We always talk about multinational, multidisciplinary funding. Let us not kid ourselves. The US NIH is the United States National Institute of Health. The European equivalents, China, whatever, are funding predominantly within their countries. Whether you're a small European country, the European Union, the US, China, Asia, within countries. And yet, everybody will tell you, aging is not only global, but we need to understand the diversity of the aging process in the environment in which we age in order to truly understand it. It is likely that if you're aging in Boston, your biological process may be different than if you're aging in Addis Ababa, or in Delhi, or in Copenhagen. Aging is not in isolation. Aging is in an ecosystem and an environment in which we live, like, probably like most diseases. It will have to be tested in those environments. So what are the treat models to not only do those studies, but fund those studies? It, it's going to rethink all of this, which really raises the question of how do you reward globally understanding the largest health challenge humanity is facing right now? We've overcome most of other. This is the tsunami we keep talking about. So how do we talk to our policymakers? What are the independent models? Well, some experimentation is going on. It's reassuring. If we look at how to connect researchers in a whole different way, one of the examples I came across recently was the Wellcome Trust. They've just launched this thing called Wellcome Leap. 650,000 scientists and engineers connected in 24 months through their network. The power of using new technologies, not to change the end game, but change the way in which we use technology to deliver the data. It's a very different thing. We keep hearing about disruption. Disruption isn't about the end decision, it's about how do you get there. Some things you can bypass, some things you can speed up. 
And this does raise the question, what's the future role of focused research organizations? They could probably take these on. DARPA was the original. And DARPA was game-changing as a model for research funding that accelerated so many things. And before DARPA, of course, we had Bell Labs and a few others. These were FROs, right? Focus research organ. What is going to be the equivalent of that FRO in aging? Have we thought that through as a field? By the way, if you're wondering, I, I'm not smart enough to have slides, so, you know, these are sort of comments. I am putting some of these together for a book chapter I'm writing about asking ourselves these questions if we're really going to move this field forward, which is fun because I'm not an insider and I certainly have no expertise in the field. This leads me then to evolution. A lot of talk, a lot of conjecture. What is evolution? What are they going to do? Everybody thinks they understand it. Let me give you a few words, and maybe we'll talk about it between sessions. Our vision, which, again, original credit to Michael Ringel, I joined the journey about three years ago, first as an advisor, and help write the vision. It's very simple. Our vision is to expand healthy lifespan for the benefit of all. Not lifespan, but healthy lifespan. Not for a few, but for the benefit of all. It was very carefully thought through. We wanted to be inclusive in every way. We wanted to focus on things that could be scaled and democratized. Because one of the things you learn as a leader, having led R&D and innovation in two completely different industries in my career over the last 20 years, food, food, industry, food and agriculture industry and pharmaceutical industry, proof of principle technologies in an academic environment are the first step. They're necessary, but not sufficient. Almost never do academic proof of principle technologies as inventions get scaled and democratized by the inventor. Almost never. What needs to happen at that point is to make that invention robust, scalable, either as a technique or a platform, and that usually doesn't result in a major publication, but it does scale. And that's when you make a difference. So the question this leads to is how do we incentivize this so both happen, this is not competing between the government sector, the academic sector, the nonprofit sector, and the industry sector. Actually, it's going to take the village. And if any one of the players thinks they can do it because they deserve all the credit, because they're the inspirational personality, I assure you, democratization happens not because of the personality, but by the leader. And the way I like to teach it is the leader who learns to lead from behind. Are you interested in the recognition or are you interested in the end game and you're willing to stand at the back of the room and hire the smartest people you can to actually make the mission happen? And it then doesn't matter who is celebrated as an individual, it's the output that was celebrated. So how do we get to that point? Okay. Thank you. So, we need the personalities. We need the champions. It's the first step. Our mission is to achieve two things. Number one, bring and then increase the number of treatment options to the market. Number two, compress the timeline of getting them to market and everything that will entail. We'll do this through a very unique operating model. I'm not aware of a single organization that ever has done it this way. We are yet to see if we're successful. But, number one, fund the research. It's very important. If we don't fund the research, the pipeline of ideas and young talent coming into this field will not grow. That's something that we can do only for a nonprofit, because there are no strings attached when we provide research funding. We don't want equity, we don't want a share of the patent, we don't want to co-publish it, we want to fund the science. And that's why it was very important to maintain the organization globally as a nonprofit. Our investors, quote, in inverted commas, expect no financial returns back, zero. 
That changes the timeline by which we fund. But the interesting thing is, we brought together a group of business leaders to run it because we want to run the nonprofit as a business. Not because of the financial returns, but because business leaders know how to bring teams together with a mission at the end of it and remain focused. That's what business teaches you very, very effectively. The second is bring about investment as a venture capital fund with one difference, 100% of a venture fund returns will be returned back to fund research and, and donated back. We will take no profits from the venture activity. We will measure our success based on the success of our businesses that we invest in. But since we're not competing with anybody for the financial returns, we're on a different time horizon. We're willing to take different risks. Time is money, risk is money. We can change that equation. We're the only organization that I know where we have substantial venture capital and research, but all the profits from the venture go back into the research. That's how we've been set up. The third is we have scale. There are plenty of organizations funding 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 million, 100 million dollars of funding. It's not enough to move this needle. It's going to have to be substantially more than that, and we're committed to that. The third, is because we're not competing with any VC or, or any government, the more the merrier. We don't want to be the first. We don't want to be the biggest. If the size of the pie grows, we will celebrate. If we end up with my team funding the smallest amount of research in the field, we will celebrate. If we're the smallest venture investor, we will celebrate. We will celebrate it because it, we allowed others to look at this and we de-risk the field, that's fine. It also means we're willing to mentor. We're also already seeing companies coming to us for investment, and as we look at them, we actually have identified, actually, your investment is good, but you have a gap in your data. Why don't we just give you a research grant with no equity, get that data, and then come back to us for the, for the venture? Tell me a VC fund that'll do that. Okay? That's what makes us different and unique in our model. So, all of this means we want to mentor, we want to convene, we want to catalyze in our own way, we want to lead this field to move forward. None of this can happen if we don't have the right talent within my organization and outside. A few words about talent inside. We're looking for people who are driven by the mission, who have passion not only for this field, the science, the potential impact we can have. And I tell everybody I've recruited, if you want to be paid the most, go into large corporations. If you want to take the biggest financial risk and return, go and join private equity. If you want to come here and really move this field, come join us. We'll pay you fair, we'll pay you well, but we have no intention for being the highest paid organization. We want experience. We want different levels of experience and we want diverse experience. I've always said one way of looking at diversity is by looking at what people look like. And I used to laugh in the US because people look at me and go, oh, you're diverse and my children who are fourth generation have no knowledge of India and Pakistan. That was four generations ago. They're about as less diverse as any Midwestern Minnesota child would be. But we look diverse. No, diversity is up here. Diversity is about your past experiences, your thought, and the thinking you bring to the table. Diversity is about being heard, not just being present. Whether you're male, female, Asian, African, doesn't matter. And so we look for that. But what's missing in this field somewhat is we need people with new disciplines. All the examples I gave you were democratized and scaled because people from the non-fields came into the market, quote, and said, we can figure out another business model for this, or we can figure out a different way of doing this. Those examples probably exist. We've got to get them in the field and get them contributing, and we can do that, and we want to do that. And ultimately, I'll finish by saying two things. One, we have to train this whole new generation of scientists, business leaders, and all the adjacent fields 
in order to grow this field for the next generation. My observation as a newcomer, and I mean no disrespect, this field is about as incestual as I've ever seen. Everybody trained up under everybody else. That's groupthink. Everybody knows a student of theirs and a professor of theirs. Just about. I'm exaggerating. Look around this room and how many of you either trained with somebody or under somebody or taught somebody? That's a problem. That means new thinking and new ideas aren't coming. You're writing the same grants. You're writing the same hypotheses. No wonder the 12 pathways haven't changed in 20 years. Why haven't they changed in 20 Have we learned no cell biology in 20 years? That we still are quoting a paper from 20 years ago. It comes up as the first slide of every investment presentation I've seen and every research funding I've seen. Raises a question, doesn't it? So how do we change that? And ultimately, the first thing I did when I launched Evolution's team was actually go to an old friend of mine, Arthur Kaplan, who's not a geroscientist, he's not a biologist. He's the chair of bioethics at NYU, formerly Johns Hopkins. First thing I did, and I asked my team to say, listen, put together a global advisory team of bioethicists. We scientists should not be defining what is ethical. We physicians should not be defining what is ethical. We need bioethicists and clinical ethicists from North America, Europe, Asia, Middle East, across the world who can give us a global perspective what it means to be ethical in this field. Why? I want to know what we should fund, what we should not fund, and this comes back to how you're going to communicate because if it's a group of scientists standing in front of the lay media and the general population about this field, forget it. You're going to scare them off. I used to work for a chips and soda company. Might have heard of it, PepsiCo. I was vice chairman of it. One of the things I learned, having had people who worked for me in 198 countries, I had people from 198 countries in my organization. One of the things you learn is you cannot succeed until you make this global. Which means you can't sit there judging people across borders like this, but say, how do we scale and democratize for the benefit of everybody? Because we all believe in the mission, whether it's to prevent hunger, poverty, global warming, or treat aging-related diseases, no different. And that's why we needed bioethicists as part of the team. And that's the first thing we did. Our operating model is putting together world experts from across the world, not the usual suspects, but from across the world, so that we can invite them in. And they are teaching us in ways. So I leave you with a quote of mine from a commencement speech that I gave a few years ago, which was, Somebody asked me about my career, it's been 40 years. By the way, those 600 million whoever followers, I can only get my five grandchildren to follow me. <laughs> my children definitely won't follow me, but my grandchildren will. They're still young enough to be really in awe of grandpa. Wait till they grow up. But this commencement speech, somebody asked me, said, um, you know, what's the key to success? And it was very simple. I said, my entire career, I've made a living out of recognizing other people's good ideas. I've never come up with a good idea in my entire career. I hope before I retire, now that I'm in my 60s, I at least can credit one good idea. I'm still waiting for it. Thank you very much. Question. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for um, this inspiring, amazing talk. We have two minutes for questions. I'm <laughs> I thought I was off the hook. No, no, <laughs> not yet and not after, as we are having you in the panel. Um, is there any question from the audience? And the, yes, yes, I saw the question on Slack. Yes. There is a question. There is a question. Do we have a microphone? Uh, 
Hi, uh, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have a question that's kind of a bottleneck that we're all facing. Uh, my name's Lou Hawthorne. I'm developing therapeutics for age-related diseases that the FDA recognizes, but we're also interested in developing for health span, which the FDA doesn't recognize. They don't recognize aging as a disease. Lately, we've been thinking that maybe the right approach to engage the FDA so that we don't have to just have this be prescribed off-label is to focus on risk. And you mentioned statins a couple of times, which is an interesting therapeutic in that it's one of the few that is prescribed based on risk rather than an existing disease. So I'm wondering if you think this might be a pathway to get the FDA on board with health span related therapeutics. I think in an earlier panel, there was a very interesting comment, which was around rare diseases. Remember, most of the champions of treating rare diseases and funding rare disease, including a fast-track regulatory path, were not industry, large or small. It was patient advocates. Okay? And in my opinion, we can get into this all the details, whether it's Europe or North America or other countries, until we have non-insider champions, you and I going as CEOs, as insiders saying, hey, I've got this great company, I'm going to make a lot of money if I'm successful, dear government, whatever, would you give me a path? Not going to work. It hasn't worked. What's important is now to get what I call real uh, media marketing savvy individuals just with advocacy, with champions. And it's going to take two things in government. One is a champion at the top. If we keep sp speaking to the workers who are getting the stuff done, they can't get the budget. They can't take the risk. If you get somebody at the top saying, I'm going to champion this cause, guess what? Whether you're in the European Union or in North America or Asia, it'll happen, number one. Number two, then you have to educate them on the path. This is why I made the comment, how do we lead from behind? Those are the key things. I think let's stop worrying about the specific path we want. Let's worry about getting this as an initiative that governments and leaders in government and other agencies will support, and let them figure out what the path they want. And it will happen. I've seen this over and over again, and there are other industries. I'll give you one which remains controversial. There was a time when there was no way GMO was going to make it to market. It was successful. It is controversial, but I assure you, the bulk of the world's food supply, whether we like it or not, it is here to stay. It changed. So, but industry and others got ahead of it, not after the fact. Does that make sense? So, we can have a whole panel on this. Again, I can give you experience from other industries. There, there are ways, but it's probably the answer is not in this room. Other questions? I hope I haven't upset anybody, by the way. I can be very controversial. I'm at a point in my career, you know, I sort of go into work every day. Somebody's going to fire me today. <laughs> and I go, that's okay. My wife, a 40 year, I've, we've been married 40 years, going to be very happy. Good, he's finally retired. <laughs> I, I'm not there looking for a job. Uh, very practical question. Yeah. Uh, how to apply for your grants. I looked at the website and you just say several words that you will have grants and no other information, project, right. evaluation, question. and other things. So that website is very recent. Without giving anything away, this week during this meeting, we'll be announcing the first of two partnerships to fund research grants. Our operating model, wherever possible, is I do not want to build a large organization don't need to do that. Everything we do, wherever possible, will be through existing organizations and partnerships, whether it's in North America, Europe, or Asia. We are close to signing a lease for a U.S. office. We are looking in the U.K. as the next phase, and then eventually European Union and others, including Asia. So each region will operate through their regional office. We will link from our website to our partner organizations where we're providing the funding. And as of this week, you'll actually see that link appear. I actually asked the team to hold on until this meeting so we could announce it during the meeting. So, 
Uh, you'll have it. And if all else fails, um, our head of research grant funding, most you know, Philippe Sia, there he is. Um, the good news is, for you guys, he never does what I tell him anyway, <laughs> which is why I loved hiring him, which is true for most of my team, if not all of them. But you convince this gentleman, the rest, you don't. I'm the least uh, path of resistance in this. You gotta convince my scientists. Great. Other questions? Hi, so thanks for your speech, really interesting. Um, the announcement was really a watershed moment for the field, and people are really keen to hear more details. So, you know, I heard it was a billion a year committed. How long will that run for? How much of the capital will go into companies versus into basic research? Can you elaborate a little bit more on the vision here? Sure. So as is uh, stated on our website in the announcement, our funding allows us to fund up to about a billion dollars a year, which will make substantially bigger than just about any organization, probably by a log scale. There's a lot of uh, research done behind field action capacity to it. science, how much for venture, etc. The first thing I'll tell you is in our my team, there's just no way we can responsibly deploy that much research funding and uh, capital by doing the due diligence, getting all of the science understood, etc. while I'm building the team. This is the analogous, I'm rewiring this plane as we're flying it, okay? And so the answer, everybody says, oh, how much are you gonna fund this year? It doesn't matter. The field doesn't yet have the capacity to absorb. What's important, which is why we wanted to fund the science and invest, is to grow the field, make, get more opportunities that are investable, and then follow it with, with capital. And we believe that if we take on the capital, if we take it to a certain level, other venture funds will follow or join us. We don't have to be the biggest. So the, the issue is not the number. Everybody gets hooked up on that. It's where, what's the opportunity? What I do know as a CEO is if we make irresponsible decisions, funding will stop, not only for us, but others will point to saying, I see, it doesn't work. The worst thing we can do as a group is actually be irresponsible. If we're responsible, demonstrate success, the size of the pie will grow as it did in rare diseases, as it did in cancer. Cancer is a hundred times bigger investment pool than aging. Why? They've seen success. <clears throat> so that's the next level of detail. I'm happy to go into more, but we're wiring this plane right now. I don't have the capacity to do all the reviews. We're putting the teams together. Okay? Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you once again for being here, for being a part of longevity movement as a physician, as a, as a great inspiration. I would like to now introduce our next speaker, who was already partially mentioned, Professor Felipe Sierra, previously from NIH, I have to mention it. <laughs> it's an insider joke. Um, uh, and now the CSO of Evolution. Um, he will be speaking about science. He was joining me as a speaker. I was extremely honored that he accepted the invitation to speak in March um, at the European Congress of Internal Medicine for thousands and thousands of physicians, internal medicine physicians, internists from all around the world, from you know, the seniors to the interns, residents, and the juniors. On, and, we, and we had a plenary discussion, plenary presentation on longevity medicine. Why I'm mentioning this? Because that's yet another symbolic moment how much longevity medicine is already trying to really represent itself as a credible, validated, evidence-based discipline in, in the medical field. So uh, with, without further <laughs> ado, I would uh, like to give the word to Professor Felipe Sierra. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for the uh, introduction and of course it's a uh, daunting task to talk after Mahmoud, such a good speaker. I mean, <laughs> you're amazing. <right? laughs> 
So I'm going to be talking about some ideas that I've been developing uh, recently, uh, part of it in collaboration with uh, Rafa De Cabo and uh, Luigi Ferrucci, but some of them uh, out of nowhere. So bear with me. This is some new ideas I want to talk. So the talk, the title, The Hallmarks of Aging and a Geroscience Approach to Health, I do rely a lot on slides because I'm a very visual person. So as Mahmoud said, yeah, everybody starts with this image. Does this show anything? Ah, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, everybody shows this image. It's not 20 years, Mahmoud, it's 10 years that has been around. And yes, there's a lot of things to be discussed and some of them I will come to about whether they're right, they're wrong, whatever. Nobody uh, will deny that there have been a watershed in the field, these pillars of aging, hallmarks of aging, and of course the introduction of the geoscience concept have changed the field in the last 10 years. But it is indeed, as was mentioned by Mahmoud, it is time to revisit this. And indeed I know that the authors of these papers are reviewing them bringing them up to, the, up to date. Every 10 years is a good time. And I will be revising, uh, reviewing some of this concept, but there's also a need to go mere, mere description of these hallmarks. How do we measure them? What do we get out of them? And we also have to correlate these molecular and cellular aspects of aging to actually the physiology of the elderly, the diseases as well and everything. I'll have, have a word about diseases. So, yes, there have been a major driver of research, and there has been a lot of discussion about where they are the right markers, the wrong markers, how come the field is so dispersed that they came up with different things. I think this is all BS. It doesn't matter. But just for the sake of it, and it's, this is something that we have been working with Rafa, basically on dissecting these things a little bit. So here are the hallmarks presented in a different order. Everybody says, oh, they came out with different things. Yes, there were different groups working for different purposes. The hallmarks of aging and the pillars of aging, they were different purposes why these things were developed. Nevertheless, there's some things that are in common. And some things that they might sound different, but actually they come out the same. Basically, uh, nutrient sensing and mitochondria is, is all metabolism, okay? And they can, you can group them like that, you can group them in any way. Anyway, and this, I don't mean it to be a new biomarkers or new hallmarks, no. But just, just as an idea, is this a, no. <laughs> it is? <laughs> ah, the other button, not the top button. Okay, so basically, I come up but there's this thing in between, so it doesn't matter. I come up with these five things that I think are the major drivers of the process, and just to put it into an image, these are, to me, and it's my personal view, of what the major drivers of the aging process are. Okay, so energetics and metabolism, epigenetics and genetics, regeneration, plasticity, and inflammation. These are processes that are a little bit broader than say cell senescence or nutrient sensing and things like that, which are more specific. Okay, this is all well and good, yeah. But we have to get practical. One thing is to define what are the major hallmarks, but we need to know how to measure them. And there have been some, some efforts on that. We have all heard about the methylation clocks. We're all sick of so many clocks. <laughs> Okay, there's uh, inflammation. There's several clocks that are being developed, okay? But does the methylation clocks really measure epigenetics? No, not really, because there's a lot of other things. We don't have a clock for histone modifications, for example, which do happen with age. They have been uh, characterized, but we don't know enough about them. Chromatin uh, re restructure, transpositions, all of those. And of course, that is true for all the other uh, major hallmarks as well. So there's a lot of things that we need to learn how to measure them so that we can really talk about how these things interact and 
and uh, work during aging. So I already showed you this figure, and it gets messed up, so the last word letter comes out. I'm an artist, so I really get annoyed with these things. <laughs> okay, but, and I told you about, uh, yeah, we have these five that I mentioned. Well, there's one that I did not mention so far. Adaptation to stress, which appears in the pillars of aging, doesn't really appear as such in the hallmarks, and that's why I didn't count it. But why didn't I consider it as a sixth element in that thing that I show you? Where is adaptation to stress? Well, to me it's very simple. Adaptation to stress, another way of saying the same thing is uh, resilience, right? Resilience is adaptation to stress. The reason I did not put in those five it's because I think resilience is by itself separate. I think res loss of resilience is the most critical driver of aging. And this brings me to one of the papers that have criticized the hallmarks, which is this uh, paper by David James and uh, Pedro Magalhães. They wanted to formalize the hallmarks and they claimed that it was not a proper formalization and so on. But that's not worry about whether that was a, r a real criticism or not. But the thing is that they wanted to formalize it in the same, same sense as cancer has been formalized. So a primary mechanism leading to the hallmarks, and that causes disease. Except it's not comparable. For one thing, because aging is not really a disease. And sorry about the ones who want to pretend it's a disease, but it's not. It's a risk factor for disease. Okay, but it's not a disease in itself. So this model is not appropriate because actually we don't have a primary cause. Aging is much more complex than that. So there's no primary cause that drives aging. However, all these hallmarks, and I'm using the image from their paper, by the way, all these hallmarks really result not on disease outcome, but in loss of resilience, right? And that is what drives, uh, drives the, uh, being a risk for, a, for disease. So basically, the way I see it is that the hallmarks, whichever hallmarks you want, five, ten, it doesn't matter, lead to loss of resilience, and that is what leads to the problems. Okay, so loss of resilience can lead to frailty, can lead to disease, Frailty can lead to disease. You can also start by disease, or you can start by frailty. No question about it. I'll come back to that in a second. But it's the inter interaction between these three domains that actually leads to, to death, which is not reversible, by the way. In case you were wondering. <laughs> okay? So why do I put resilience as the beginning? Uh, I think you have all seen this old image uh, that we have used many, many times. The reason I put resilience first is simply because of timing. If you look at frailty, it's something I've said many, many talks before. Frailty happens too late in life. By the time I'm told I'm frail, what they're really telling me is, hey, you're about to die. Bye. It's not very helpful, right? I am not frail at all. I'm 68, I'm not frail. By the time I become frail, it's gonna to be too late, okay? So, frailty happens too late. Well, in contrast, resilience happens much earlier. This is running world records. I don't remember for which length. Uh, sorry about everybody, but after 30, you don't have the same resilience that you had before. Okay, it starts going down. As I always say, I can party uh, as before, but then the next day I cannot walk. <laughs> okay, so my resilience at 68 is not what it was at 60. So what if we could measure this drop in resilience early in life before we have problems so we can correct the trajectory before we end up having problems, okay? so. In my view, if we want to really uh, link aging to disease, we have been putting, whoops, 
We have been putting a lot of effort into frailty, but we really have to add resilience. The problem, we don't know how to measure it. <laughs> okay, but that's, that's an issue to address. That's what we need to develop as a field. We need to measure, develop measures of resilience. So how, how does it work? You have the hallmarks of aging, and you can choose anyone. You can choose cells and essence, for example, and just see how it affects, how it affects resilience. resilience. Molecular resilience, I've written some about defining what it is, but uh, I'm not going to go into details. But you measure how you lose your resilience if you modify cells and essence. And then, then you look at how they affect frailty, disease, and death. Okay? The important thing is don't just go look at death. Look at frailty, look at disease, but mostly look at uh, resilience. Of course, you can do it with cells and essence, you can do it with proteostasis, with whatever you want. So, uh, since I mentioned here death uh, and diseases, I want to talk a little bit about that and how my own thoughts have evolved on that domain. So this is one of the, one of or the earliest paper on geroscience ever published. Uh, by myself and Ron Kohansky. So we were trying to link aging biology to disease. That's how we defined geroscience. That's what we put in the Wikipedia, uh, is linking aging with disease. I'm changing a little bit the emphasis right now. I think that what we really need to do is to link aging at the molecular and cellular level with physiology, with those things that are not diseases but that keep us from being happy. That's the bottom line, okay? So we need to change a little bit the, the way we're approaching this. The problem, just like I said, we don't have a way to measure uh, resilience. We also don't know what do we mean by health. What are the hallmarks of health? There have been several attempts, like by Lopez Otin, by uh, George Kuschel, Ron Kohansky, I'm going to focus primarily on this one, the intrinsic capacities, which were defined by the World Health Organization as those things that allow us to do the things we enjoy in life. Okay? I always give, as an, as an example, we put all of our uh, effort into cancer and cardiovascular disease because that kills us. But if I get arthritis, I will be very unhappy because what I like to do is to paint and play the guitar. If I get arthritis in my fingers, I won't be able to do the things that I like in life. All right? So we need to focus on other things. And the way they measure, they define intrinsic capacity the World Health Organization was five domains, cognition, locomotion, sensory, vitality, and psychological. And on each of these, they define a few things that can be measured to address those issues. I'm going to focus on this one because actually it's the one I like the most. I was working on that when I was in, uh, in Toulouse in France, so I'm more familiar with it. So we can make it pretty like in the previous uh, thing and put those five domains and the things that are associated with it. Let me put it in a more boring way. But this is exactly the same. I don't know why the slides look so different. <laughs> OK, but that's basically the five domains and the things that we can measure of them. OK, good, that's fine. The thing that we need to do really is to, uh, to actually connect those things that are the molecular and cellular hallmarks of aging with those more physiological uh, aspects of aging. And it's complex because they all interact. But we do need to measure how does metabolism uh, and quantitate, quantitate exactly how, how does metabolism relate to con con cognition, to locomotion, etc. Quantitate those things. But for doing that, we have to know exactly what we mean by metabolism, and we need to know exactly what we mean by, by con cognition. Of course, we can do it the other way, what's the role of cognition and everything. But basically, we need to know exactly what we're talking about. 
And it becomes a little bit more complicated if you draw it that way, right? Because there's way too many connections there. It becomes a, an impossible maze to find. So hopefully, um, people working on AI will help us with that, looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> because it's way too complicated. And we have, as I say, it's not just a matter of quantitating of, of measuring how memory affects telomeres or telomeres affect memory. No, it's not just that. It's how much that interaction plays a role, right? Because some of these interactions will be very strong, some of them will be weak. And that's important to, to establish. Then we have a complex maze in here, and then we add diseases, and forget it. It becomes way too complicated, way too complicated for me at least. So, just to finish, one more thought. Since I am talking about diseases in there, is that we have to stay away from them. Forget about diseases, please. So, classical medicine has always focused on diseases, comorbidities, dependency, all of these bad things that happen. I used to joke when I was at the NIA that I was duped because I was told I was working on the National Institute of Health, but in fact, I was working on the National Institute of Diseases. There's the Cancer Institute, the Cardiovascular Institute, the, Digest, the Diabetes Institute. It's the National Institute of Diseases. Let's forget about the diseases. Let's focus on the health. So let's focus on the intrinsic capacity, maintenance of these intrinsic things that make us happy. Avoiding frailty and focus on resilience. So those are focusing on health rather than focusing on disease. And I think that that's an important thing that we need to change the way biomedicine is. So to finish, I've talked actually, believe it or not, I've talked about four different topics. <laughs> so first of all, about the hallmarks. I think the hallmarks were really an important point in the field. It was important to conceptualize a little bit the different areas that we were all working on. But they need to be updated. Yes, this has to be a live uh, enterprise. You have to maybe add uh, the microbiome. We didn't know about the microbiome then, okay? Maybe we need to add fibrosis. Maybe we need to remove the telomeres. My own idea, I don't know how many of you work on telomeres, but okay. So we need to revisit them often, okay? We need to have measurable outcomes and biomarkers for them. It's all good, well and good to measure, uh, to say that proteostasis is important, but how exactly, what can we measure that reflects the changes in proteostasis in an organism? And an important concept, Yes, the biomarkers are not the same as targets. That's something that happens very often that they get confused. The other thing is molecular resilience. So I define molecular resilience as that resilience that every cell has to have. Okay? So it's not resilience to a particular challenge. It's what every cell, every cell has to have. The example I usually give is if you, if you get treated with uh, chemotherapy, every single cell in your body the one on the top of your nose will have to react because otherwise it dies. What's the capacity of the cell to react? It gets lost with age. To what extent? How? And how can we measure it? And I propose, this is my proposal, is I, this is a unified driving of the aging process. It's what brings the whole thing together. But we need to develop measures there. By definition, to measure resilience, you have to stress the system. And especially in humans, stressing them is maybe not a good idea. <laughs> so we need to me me develop measurements. The other thing I talk is we need to link these molecular and cellular things. I'm a biochemist by training, but these molecular and cellular things need to be linked to outputs in physiology. It's very important. And we actually need hallmarks of aging physiology. We're very far from that. And the last thing, that I mentioned is, never mind about diseases. Never mind, forget them, it's not important. We use them as a, as a test for things, yes, but the focus has to be on health, 
not on diseases. And I think that's the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sierra. Please stay maybe for one question that we can accommodate. Oh, we are a little sure. bit ahead of time, but if there is, I'm sure there is some. Thank you. Concretely, do you plan to devote a substantial part of evolution budget to, to basic uh, research into the biology of aging? I'm trying to convince the boss, but <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, we are. As, as Mahmoud said, if we don't do that, the pipeline will dry up in two or three years. If we only stay with what we know, two or three years from now, we're not gonna have anything new to test. So we have to uh, devote some funds to basic research with a one caveat. It has to be translatable. It has to eventually lead to improving human health. It doesn't need to be translate, trans, uh, translational research, but it has to be translatable. Okay, so there's a little dis disconnect, disconnect there that we'll have to deal with about what we fund. But yes, we will fund basic research as well. Right. Um, maybe we can take the questions to the, to the polls that we will have after the next lecture. I'm very sorry, it's, it's never enough time. Thank you never so enough. much once again, <laughs> Professor Sierra, for this great lecture. And we will, have, we will have all the speakers in the panel at 4.45 again, so there will be more opportunities. And now I would like to present our next speaker that I'm extremely happy to have here, Professor James Kirkland from Mayo Clinic, an um, internist, so a great, uh, great leader and a role model for myself, and also um, the leader of the Aging Institute. I will just pass the word to you. Uh, please don't worry about time. Just take your time. So can everyone hear me? Let me see how to make this stuff go forward. Okay, so by way of disclosures, um, it was mentioned before that sometimes uh, academics have problems working with industry, and this is especially the case with academics who are in the US who are actually enrolling patients in clinical trials and consenting them. So there are special rules that apply. I can have no founder shares, I can have no interest, I can have no stock, I can have no discussions with any companies if there's any payment involved. And that's a federal law. So uh, this goes beyond the restrictions that basic researchers have, just so that everyone's um, aware that there are these um, rules in place and they, they do have an effect on how we can pr proceed. So as I'm not gonna belabor this as we've heard before, the f uh, aging research field um, or biology of aging field has gone from a period of description through mechanism, through development of interventions in preclinical models to uh, where it is now and that's at the point of translation, the so-called valley of death uh, between the bench and the bedside. Um, again, I'm not going to go over the Jarrah science hypothesis. Maymood predicted everybody would show something about this. Uh, that's in fact the case. But one thing I'd argue, and I'll come back to, is that these fundamental aging processes are not distinct. They're highly interlinked. And if you, that means that not only if one occurs, do not, the others also tend to occur. But if you target any one of them, there's increasing evidence that you target all the rest, irrespective of the intervention. There are at least 35 categories of interventions now that appear to target fundamental aging processes. Um, I'm not gonna talk in great detail about any one of them, just I'm more familiar with cellular senescence and senolytics and some of the others, but in the cases of all of them, there are multiple diseases, disorders, uh, dysfunction, uh, failed resilience, and so forth that these interventions will delay, prevent, alleviate, or treat in preclinical models. And in some cases, these things are interconvertible, in some cases they're not. For example, why would you give a senolytic to an individual who has no senescent cells? Why would you give an NAD precursor to an 80 or a 90 year old who might have preclinical cancers where you're gonna give that preclinical cancer a selective advantage over other cells in that individual? So these kinds of interventions are gonna to have to be phased. 
to the right conditions at the right point in the lifespan. Um, we're enough to think about combinations of them or not. They may be less than additive when we combine them because if you target one fundamental aging mechanism, you tend to target the rest. So they may be less than additive. Where there could be additivity is with disease-specific interventions. And it appears in the early cases where this is being done, including in early, very early clinical data, that if you, for example, um, target a process like fibrosis with a TGF-beta-1 inhibitor, for example, along with a senolytic, you get a more than additive effect, you get a synergistic effect. And this could be the case with other disease processes. So a next phase is going to be combining geroscience interventions with disease-specific interventions, arguably. Um, this is just one example of how these processes are interconnected. So senescent cells produce factors that affect progenitor cell dysfunction. They don't uniformly decrease it. In some cases, they increase it. So uh, senescent cells produce factors that increase osteoclast formation. Osteoclasts are the cells that break down bone. So osteoclast progenitor differentiation is enhanced by the pro-inflammatory, pro-apoptotic form of senescent cells, which is about 30 to 70 percent of them. Uh, whereas senescent cells produce factors that inhibit osteoblasts from differentiating, and osteoblasts are the cells that make new bone. So there isn't a uniform decrease or increase in one particular stem or so-called stem or progenitor cell function. There are changes that occur um, in either direction that can be dysfunctional. And if you target senescent cells, for example, you reverse these things. So, um, and this has led to clinical trials of age-related osteoporosis, for example, that are underway at the moment with different senolytics. Uh, because these agents in preclinical models both increase bone, bone formation and decrease bone resorption, unlike uh, anti-resorptive therapies, which result in a coupled decrease in bone formation. Um, another example of the interrelatedness is that um, senescent cells produce factors that decrease alpha clotho. Clotho was a Greek fake goddess who holds up the spool of life. She's the goddess of pregnancy, starts the thread of life. Atropolos is the one at the end, the last of the three fake goddesses who has the knife that cuts the thread. Uh, atropine is derived from that name. The Greeks used atropine or belladonna to tip arrows and kill people. So, um, if you transplant senescent cells into younger individuals, you get decreased brain and kidney and fat tissue alpha clotho. If you overexpress alpha clotho in experimental animals, mice, you get around a 30% increase in life and health span. Um, if you, um, you find that alpha clotho is decreased in um, individuals with cancers, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and the list goes on and on. And if you give senolytics, including to humans, you get increases in alpha clotho. So these things are totally linked. We've talked about the last phases of the lifespan, but fundamental aging processes begin arguably before conception even. It's turning out that Down syndrome is um, a disorder related to fundamental aging processes uh, associated with aging of the oocyte. Uh, and it looks like trisomy 21 results in a senescence-driven disease. Um, and it looks like in human neurospheres that you can, re in, you, can, you can accelerate human neurite growth in trisomy 21 human neurospheres by treating with senolytics. So this is leading to clinical trials now on the horizon, but haven't started yet, for, um, with senolytics for adult Down syndrome. Uh, Dr. Prakash, who's chair of physiology at Mayo, found that uh, he's an anesthetist and he's also chair of physiology. He um, found that giving hyperoxia to resuscitate babies at birth drives cellular senescence in the lungs and is associated with asthma developing between the ages of two and four. Preeclampsia turns out to be a senescence-related disease with um, spread of senescent cells from the placenta of the mother to the mother. So these fundamental aging processes can be operative root cause contributors to uh, diseases and disorders throughout the lifespan, including in children. So is longevity, this is um, an argument I'm going to make, but I may be wrong, and a lot of people may disagree with this, especially some of the people who work with uh, simple model organisms. It's often said that is long, longevity is the gold standard of determining if something is targeting a fundamental aging process, but is it really? Um, I think we need to think about this. A number of other things that was mentioned before, 
patients who come to me as a physician, I'm a geriatrician, almost never, well, they've never told me, I want to live to be 120. I've never heard that once. There have been informal surveys done by AARP and others, and uh, we were talking with Mahmoud and Felipe earlier, there need to be formal surveys done by someone like Gallup to look at what, what are people's expectations at different phases of life and, and their comfort with the term longevity. I can tell you that in 80-year-olds, they're not comfortable with that term. Uh, what they, they don't want to live to be 120 and feel like they're 120. They want their symptoms and their problems dealt with within the next few weeks. They want to be healthy, independent, free of pain, free of disability. Not only that, health span does not always equate with increased lifespan. In, in experimental animal models, for example, metformin does not increase lifespan, but it does re reduce age-related morbidity. Conversely, increased lifespan, for example, by decreasing IGF-1 levels, does not always result in increased health span. I think if you ask the, the Laurent Dwarfs in Vilcabamba, Ecuador, who live a long time, have low IGF-1, but are dying of depression and committing suicide, and are just slightly over a meter tall, you know, are, is, is that really desirable? Is, is there a real link between lifespan and health span there? So these are, these are just some things to, to think about. So agents that appear to target fundamental aging mechanisms don't always affect the parent lifespan, and that's because there can be probably redundant mechanisms that affect lifespan. Uh, and if you're targeting a single process, for example, metformin, where you're targeting uh, basically the secretory state of senescent cells through um, inhibiting mitochondrial complex 4, it doesn't result in an increase in lifespan in mice, but it does result in decreased um, disorders and diseases. Um, and then agents that might increase apparent maximum lifespan in preclinical models may have annoying effects. For example, um, acarbose would be a real boon to the sanitary industry. Um, rapamycin, generally, um, at, at lower doses, I think it does a very different thing than at higher doses, but at higher doses, it can cause dysfunction. And I think Joan would argue, rightly, that, that that's a very different thing than what you see with uh, lower doses. But there are going to be dose responses that we have to think about with some of these interventions. They're, they're not always going to be right in the right person at the right stage. Um, many preclinical lifespan models, furthermore, are protected from the, from the environment. We talk about outbred mice in particular trials, but they're protected from bacteria. They're protected from the things that cause decreased resilience in the real world. So is that a perfect model? Um, and then the other problem is that looking at maximum lifespan would take half a century to a century to study in humans. Is studying outbred animals at all costs essential? Again, one could argue about this, and I guess um, especially in the, um, in the Arabian Peninsula, where there are large inbred populations, uh, people there might argue, no, you've got to look at inbred populations. You know, uh, people are dying 10 years earlier in parts of the UAE and Saudi Arabia than other people who come from inbred families of early Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and so forth. They're dying 10 years earlier. Now, another thing, and I think I'm preaching to the converted here, um, when we're talking about geroscience interventions, we're no longer thinking in the old-fashioned way about a single drug, a single target, and a single disease or disorder. What we're talking about in the geroscience space is multi-mechanism agents or combinations, dirty drugs, in other words, or combinations that hit multiple intracellular processes or even cell types like senescent cells, and you're going after everything in the book. You're going after delaying, preventing, alleviating, or treating, I disagree a little bit with Felipe, uh, particular age-related diseases, because there may be a role for these agents in early trials to treat age-related diseases, actually treat them. Don't know yet, but those kinds of trials are underway. So at least the FDA, when you speak to them, view developing um, antibiotics as, as um, a model uh, for developing things like senolytics, and they use the same regulatory path. 
which is very distinct from the one drug, one target, one disease approach. So there are many ways of going at how do you translate these things. Well, one thing, again, as a clinician, um, I'm always worried about risk versus, versus benefit in clinical trials. So in my mind, if you're starting clinical trials in, in, in people, unless you've proven a drug is safe upside and down for decades, you're not going to be able to start a trial for prevention. Um, you have to start trials for disorders, and it's easiest to start disorders for which there's no satisfactory treatment and for which outcomes are disastrous. So this is, this is a path forward for initiating smaller trials that regulatory agencies will generally go along with and ethical review committees will side with you on. One of the things we've been fortunate enough to have through the National Institutes of Health in the United States is the Translational Geroscience Network. So um, initially it involved eight uh, institutions that are listed at the top. Uh, five more have become involved and many more are getting involved. And this is a way of bringing together people who are doing uh, geroscience clinical trials, going through this late phase preclinical to early phase clinical uh, bench to bedside translation and to try to coordinate this in a way so that um, irrespective of the intervention, if it's a senolytic, a senomorphic like rapamycin or metformin, uh, NAD precursor, um, a CD38 inhibitor, I mean uh, inhibitor, sirtuin agonist, anti-inflammatory or whatever, irrespective of whether it's a disease or disorder or condition in children through the very elderly, we're measuring the same things across all the trials. And I don't just mean body fluid things, I mean um, cognitive function testing, physical function testing, um, uh, imaging, uh, ECGs, everything, trying to coordinate them so that we can compare these kinds of things across trials and test this unitary hypothesis. That is, if you use these interventions, are you targeting multiple fundamental aging processes? And in a way, by doing multiple disorders in parallel instead of series, that are related to fundamental aging processes, can you look for commonalities across these things? So just by way of early examples of some of the trials that are coming along with interventions, and these are very, very early trials. Most of them are phase one or they're case control studies, so they're, they've got all the problems, all the biases, all the difficulties that you have if you don't have a placebo group and it's open label, and they're, they're just all kinds of things that go wrong with them. Uh, but there are some early promising results. For example, with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is uh, a senescence-driven disease, a three-site trial, very small, um, you know, just of a few days of senolytics, uh, nine doses over three weeks, and then looking at people um, five days after their last dose compared to, in, compared to looking at them before their first dose. And incidentally, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is, is associated with marked frailty. In fact, people die more of things related to frailty than they do of shortness of breath with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But we, we found improved six minute walk distance, um, uh, six meter gait speed, um, chair stands, and short physical performance battery. But this is an open label phase one trial, so you really have to take it with a complete grain of salt. But it is leading, at least to power calculations, in the beginnings of a phase 2A trial. There is target engagement with some of these things. Uh, I know various groups are working with other interventions and find that there is target engagement. In the case of senolytics, um, for example, you can demonstrate if you do fat biopsies and give a short course of senolytics, and then a while after the senolytics are no longer present because they act in a hit and run fashion. Senescent cells don't divide. Once they're dead, they're dead. It takes two to three hours for a senolytic to start killing a senescent cell, 18 hours for it to be killed. So you can give these things once a month or whatever, um, but there is a decrease in um, adipose tissue in younger women with um, obesity, diabetes, and incipient renal failure who have a lot of senescent cells in their adipose tissue. There is a, a decrease in certain markers of cellular senescence. There's a decrease in um, inflammatory cells because senescent cells attract, activate, and anchor immune cells, and there's a decrease in fibrosis or crown-like structures. One of the parts of the Translational Geroscience Network is a facility for geroscience analysis, so we're measuring the same things across all the trials uh, in the same way, using the same standard operating procedures. 
uh, and we're measuring about 150 things um, across the trials in uh, blood, urine, uh, buccal swabs, saliva, um, et cetera, and we're, beginning, we're banking or beginning to bank for microbiome, um, hair, clip, hair uh, and nail clippings, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're trying to measure is everything, every, the markers of every fundamental aging process across the trials, irrespective of the intervention, plus disease-specific um, uh, uh, markers across all the trials. So we've talked a little bit about biomarkers. I'm more interested in what we've sort of relabeled Jared Diagnostics. As a clinician and most patients, they're not terribly interested in mere aging clocks. The best aging clock you have is your birth certificate and a pocket calendar. Um, what they're interested in more is are there things that you can um, assay that'll predict what kind of intervention they should take when uh, does the intervention um, cause a change in that uh, marker and does the change in that marker caused by an intervention predict um, improvement from the particular condition you're trying to treat. Uh, and I've listed some of the characteristics that the FDA requires for um, uh, a, a so-called biomarker to be acceptable as a primary endpoint in a clinical trial, like blood pressure or blood glucose. And, you know, so there, as Felipe said, there are a lot of things that are interesting to measure. They might be predictive, but they're not going to be disease targets necessarily, and they may not change in response to treatment. GDF-15 comes to mind, for example. It's a very good predictor of frailty, of death, of um, hip fractures, all kinds of things. But exercise or caloric restriction or metformin make it go up too. So it, it goes in the wrong direction if you use an intervention. So it, it's going to be very useful as a predictive thing, but not um, as something that a physician would use to track whether a patient's getting better. Um, in some of these trials, we've uh, across these trials, we're trying to work on developing composite scores of Jared diagnostics that could be used to track um, clinical trials. And everybody has their favorite individual marker. Our view is that there'll eventually be a composite. There'll be no one single marker that's particularly good in absolutely every situation. And the question is, and this kind of composite score um, will likely change over time, and it takes some very advanced math and all the rest of it to be able to uh, come up with these things. And we had a consensus conference uh, that involved the FDA and um, industry philanthropists and some of the people in the room here um, looking at um, um, what it would take for the FDA to accept things as um, a primary um, outcome in a clinical trial. And one of the consensuses was that everybody should probably give up their own little favorite biomarker for a dollar and create something like um, an internet or a highway that everybody could share in. Uh, highways are publicly funded. The trucks driving down the highways make money for companies, the same way as the internet is publicly funded. And the big, big pharma were, said their proprietary things they would be willing to give away for a dollar. Um, here I'm showing what I mentioned before about alpha clotho, for example, so, and how these things are interlinked. So we're measuring clotho in urine across all these trials, for example. And in 20 out of 20 subjects treated for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, for example, senolytics make alpha clotho go up in the urine. So there are a number of regulatory issues. Um, our approach has been, in this particular approach, is to um, do studies for disease indications so that, um, you know, that have ICD codes, and these are FDA-regulated uh, kinds of trials. And we're academics, and so we find trials using approved agents um, uh, and so forth, and natural products that are safe are much easier to get past in clinical trials than um, uh, new chemical entities. That said, um, anything you do, if you prescribe water for a disease, it becomes a drug, and you need a full IND from the FDA to do it. We had to get a full IND, for example, for Fazetin, which is in strawberries and cucumbers, from the FDA. It took two and a half years, 450 pages of writing, two species, including monkeys, uh, had to set up our own GF, GMP manufacturing because no company would ever want to do it, so we had to raise money from philanthropy to do it. Uh, had to set up our own stability testing, our own um, 
uh, degradation product testing, everything, the whole yard, nine yards before we could proceed with the first clinical trial. So this is a roadblock that, you know, arguably Felipe and, and Mahmoud and others um, might be able to help out with a bit or that governments have to think about. Um, in our view, the FDA has been very helpful because we're academics, we're not going for registration. And with us, we don't care if we make primary outcomes on trials. It's not held against us. Secondary and exploratory outcomes are just as important and informative because we're not trying to get something on the formulary. So the trials underway, they're uh, in the translational geroscience network. There are about 30 trials underway at the moment, another 15 going to be starting. And they range for everything from uh, childhood cancer survivors and the frailty that they develop in accelerated aging-like state to um, frailty in the very elderly, that is women with a gait speed who are over 70 of less than 0.6 meters per second, which has a 50% two-year survival, to three trials for Alzheimer's disease, to a trial for mild cognitive impairment, to trials for osteoporosis, osteoarthritis. The osteoarthritis one is being funded by the US Navy, for example, um, to trials for um, um, uh, diabetes, obesity, uh, and other trials are going to begin for a range of conditions like uh, Down syndrome and so forth. One of the interesting things that we got into is looking at um, what happens with um, zero gravity and um, cosmic and solar radiation uh, with respect to astronauts. Uh, so on the Axiom launch, which we, several of us in the room, had to go down to, and it took off from 39B, which is the same pad that Apollo took off from. We were three miles from it. You're literally blown backwards by this thing going off. But we measured the urine and blood in the astronauts before they went. They took up pre-senescent cells with them, had to design special incubators, flasks, and medium change systems, had to put Velcro on everything so that you could stick everything, you know, because everything's flying around. You don't want needles full of medium flying at people in the ISS. And they're going to make an exhibit with all of these uh, bits and pieces we had to design that's going into the Smithsonian Children's Museum. But uh, we don't know the result. Well, I know the sort of the results, but I can't talk about them yet. But uh, it is, it is, it's already been known for some time that um, pilots, uh, flight attendants, and especially astronauts get a lot of early age-related disorders. Uh, and astronauts, particularly who've been outside the Von Allen belt, like to the moon, are dying 10 years earlier than they should have Alzheimer's disease. And we worked with Brookhaven and the Colorado Space Center and people at UT San Antonio, and we found that solar radiation, it takes 1 40th the dose of solar radiation to induce senescence that it does with X-rays or gamma rays, because you're dealing with silicon, hydrogen, and helium flying at light speed. We also know that astronauts come back with DNA degradation products in their blood and their urine, even on short flights. So we're not going to Mars unless we can solve some of these kinds of issues. So we're not going to be able to deal with what happened, might happen in the Ukraine with all the shelling going on around that nuclear reactor unless we can understand um, some of these fundamental aging processes. We're not going to be able to improve agriculture, for example, wool production uh, and length of time and color, color and quality of wool in South America or milk or egg production in sub-Saharan Africa unless we can understand some of these geroscience measures. So Tame, Nir, I see Nir is here, he's going to talk about it. It's a different approach, but Nir and I use the term or, or and, not or, for looking at TAME versus looking at multiple age-related conditions in parallel. So Nir and I started, well, Nir started the TAME thing, but that came out of an R25 that we had where the uh, Translational Geroscience Network also started. So this is very much an and approach. <laughs> I'm gonna wind up with a few very controversial things. And that, that, my mantra is always, the needs of the patient come first. I'm not allowed to make extra money or anything like that. So it doesn't even get into the picture. So I'm both a basic scientist and um, a clinical geriatrician. And there's a huge gulf between basic scientists and clinical geriatricians. Uh, there's even dislike uh, on, on both sides. And there's certainly misunderstanding. So what can be done to bridge the gulf between the strong views held in the basic biology uh, of aging community versus physicians who are in clinical practice? For example, this controversy about longevity at all costs versus the needs to develop interventions for people who have here and now conditions. 
Um, and we also need to train um, physician scientists who can bridge this valley of death. So one of the things that again came out of the Jara Science Network was an R25 grant given by the NIH to create a program in clinical Jara Science. We've had a number of trainees through now. They train in geriatric medicine. They get three years of basic Jara Science training, the equivalent of a PhD. Um, it's extremely popular. At Mayo, the chief resident at Mayo opted to do this. And she's got a staff position now at Mayo that she's finished it. So this is highly popular amongst the trainees because there are maybe less than two dozen people in the world who are qualified in both geriatrics and uh, basic uh, geroscience and can see the, the disparate needs of both groups and do what it takes to bridge this valley of death between the bench and the bedside. So, sorry for bringing up a lot of controversial things. Um, I, I know that some of these things may be poison pills to both the clinicians on the one hand and the basic scientists on the other. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe in the discussion we can talk about some of them later. I'm not sure I've got an established position on any of them at this point, uh, but the, these are things I hear from patients, I hear from our trainees at the, at the bench, and I hear at meetings like this. So, it's going to be an interesting next few years, and we'll see if some of these things are a flash in the plan or they'll, whether they'll work. The other thing I just caution is, when it comes to some of these interventions, when we're talking to patients as physicians, we have to be very, very careful. The chance of a phase 2A trial working is from 5 to 10 percent, no matter how good you think the intervention is. Part of our reason for doing multiple trials in parallel instead of in series is because we know that 95, 90 to 95 percent of the trials will fail. And so we want to make sure there are a few wins interspersed amongst the failures. And we need to tell the public that these things may look as good as all get out, but they have a high chance of failing. And, but they, what they are is a springboard to doing better trials with better agents and to moving on. They shouldn't be viewed by the public if they come out as negative, which most of them will, as a stopping point for the field. So I think we have to be very careful in messaging going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Kurivan, for this amazing talk. Thank you for the controversial things. These are the ones that we want to discuss and we want to hear, and it's very important. Um, we will shift the questions to the panel discussion, and we will make now a very short break, five minutes for physio physiological break, um, and we will be back with the, until 3.25. 25.